first, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about what community means. We recently just came out of the field on a study we called Millennials in the Middle, where we looked at um, Gen Z and Millennials to really understand what they think about community and how they define community. And we're going to be talking a lot about the different definitions of community today. It's a really interesting topic, and the four panelists here have sort of nailed it in a way that's really intriguing. First, we have Courtney from um, Courtney Rashawn from Ottawa. She has traveled uh, the furthest of all of our of all of our panelists today to be here, and her programs are super interesting. And I think you'll all have something to take away from what she has to say. Next, we have. Josh. Uh, Josh Albright is from the Visit Milwaukee team, and he has done a remarkable job of creating community in a way that both honors what happens on the ground in the community, physical, geographic community, but also really in, is intriguing in the way people will engage when they're a visitor to Milwaukee. We also have Corinne. Corinne is here from, uh, Corinne Hogue is here from Pack Up and Go a company you all should be aware of. They're a surprise travel company, and they do really, really remarkable things for your DMOs, inviting people in ways that are intriguing and full of data on what people are actually looking for. And then finally, we have Dakota Snyder, who is traveled not as far, but maybe the depth of snow he had to go through from Mammoth Lakes to get here was, was more intense than anybody else's trip. So we want to start first by talking about community. And each of these folks has, has done some really, really remarkable things. So let's start by finding out what they mean when they're talking about community and how they define community. So Courtney, do you want to start? Sure. So we define community by looking at the local resident and, you know, not to harp on the pandemic, but coming out of the pandemic, we also looked at, you know, some of the organized, or the businesses rather, that were heavier hit. And those were the smaller businesses, the mom and pop shops, the, you know, entrepreneur endeavors. And so that's what we kind of focused on when we were looking at community. And Ottawa is the Canada's capital, and we have a lot of cultural institutions. And so we're actually home to six, sorry, <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Six of the seven national museums um, in the whole country. And so it's a big piece of who we are. And what we wanted to do, and, and what you saw on the screen earlier, was unofficial museums. We looked at all these other local smaller businesses in the community and elevated them to the same level as our official museums and our cultural institutions and put them out on a national stage so that they were getting that front and center share of voice. So we had, you know, uh, Record Center 2 was the unofficial museum of crate digging. And we had, you know, unofficial museum of uh, treasure troving, and that would be, you know, a, a secondhand store. And so we really looked at all of the other businesses that kind of make the destination exactly what people want to come and visit for. So Josh, what about you? What, what made you focus on community and what motivated this this? focus on community from Milwaukee. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for all destinations, the people are one of those things that truly makes any destination unique and vibrant and alive. And so being able to focus on the community and the shared stories that come together to celebrate the community that really define it uh, seemed like a, a natural component of what a DMO should do. It's uh, listening to the people to tell the stories of the people. Uh, and then we really wanted to find that unique um, aspect of everyone's individual uh, pillar within the community, so everybody has their own unique experience that they bring to the table that then collectively shapes the community, and so we really wanted to highlight that. What about you, Corinne? How, do, how does Pack Up and Go play in the DMO space, and, and what does community mean to you guys? And why don't you tell the folks a little bit about what Pack yeah, Up and Go Yeah, for sure. Uh, so as Meredith said, I'm not a destination. I am with Pack Up and Go. Um, we do send travelers to more than 300 different destinations across the United States. But so my uh, definition of community is a little bit more broad, I think a little more philosophical. So I think what brings people together in a community is looking, you know, uh, for a shared relationship or set of beliefs. And so what spawned us to want to create uh, a community around our brand was in the travel space. You know, when I was, when I joined Pack Up and Go five years ago and I was looking around at how brands were marketing travel, I saw a lot of destinations, no offense to anyone here, um, and a lot of influencers, which was really picture perfect. And none of that felt like pack up and go. None of that felt like the community that we wanted to build. Um, so our number one core value is hold the traveler experience above all else. 
And so I started to think how I could bring that message into our marketing. And so we really focused on the travelers themselves and brought them and our community um, in to uh, our marketing through user-generated content and really focusing on building that community across the country and all of our many travelers and destinations. So Dakota, being in Mammoth Lakes, has a very different community this winter than uh, in previous years. So talk about that and talk about how you really focus on community in, in your DMO effort. Yeah, definitely. So community is such an important aspect of what we do. It's We're a small town, right? We have just over 7,000 year-round residents that live in Mammoth Lakes, yet we have an influx of 40,000 tourists on an average weekend that come in. So yesterday on our panel, we talked a little bit about this idea of over-tourism and so many people coming in. Well, our stakeholders, our local businesses, they obviously want to see good business. And one of our large reasons for our, our creation at Mammoth Lakes Tourism was to help fill the shoulder seasons, right? To help create spring and to help create fall and help create drive during those periods of time. However, if we don't have an accurate pulse check on what's going on in our community, then nothing else matters. If we have a lot of visitors in town, but they're not acting appropriately, right? all these different things start to carry in. So we are entirely based on what we're up to with community first and making sure that the message that we're putting out is a representation of what our entire community's values are. And so when you say community, it's not just these little individual spaces that are existing within. It's our overall large community that we're representing and that we're really having to be a loud vocal voice for amongst the entire tourism industry of people that are coming to town. So it's a kind of different perspective when you're looking at something on such a micro scale that overall is so macro all the way out. And that's a really interesting point because, you know, all of us are in the business of promoting our communities, but also simultaneously protecting our communities. So the next question that we want to explore is how do you stress test the idea of community without harming what makes your communities so special? This is a really interesting concept, right? How do you promote the things which make your communities special without making them less special in the way that you're engaging with external audiences? So Josh, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because I think what you've done has really demonstrated a way to celebrate and protect, but also expand. Yeah, definitely. So we've started a, a new television show called Good Things Brewing. We, uh, we filmed our own uh, television series of 30-minute episodes uh, where we've asked locals to be our tour guides uh, throughout the city. And th this allowed us really to go into neighborhoods and celebrate uh, a sort of, uh, you know, from the street view of different neighborhoods in our community. There's 191 different uh, neighborhoods in Milwaukee. Uh, that's a lot of different stories to tell. Now, to be good stewards of what those neighborhoods represent, the, the ethnic backgrounds, the style, the approach, the, just the vibrancy that each neighborhood would have, we had to have people from those, those elements and those neighborhoods tell those stories in, in an authentic way. And so the show really became a great way for us to uh, sort of control it without controlling it. So we controlled who was going to be on the show, but then we let it up to them. They, they got to pick which restaurants to go to, which barbershops to show, which parks they uh, love to see. And then they tell the stories about why they, those things became special to them. And it wasn't about, um, hey, I need, I need you to see this park and sit on these swings. It was the personal story of... I came to this park, I sat in the swing with my, my mother, who happens to be the downtown development person or whatever. Things like that came out of it. And so you had these real moments of connection. And so the stress test uh, part of it was, you know, we, we know we don't, we, we want to drive people to these neighborhoods in, in a way that's uh, positive for the entire community, but we don't want to overload it. Uh, and so by sharing these individual stories, people could pick and choose which neighborhood to go to or which story most resonated with them and made, made that connection. And, um, and so it wasn't all going to one spot. You know, easily, the, what we talk about a lot about multi-level visitation for our team and how we get, guide people through the city of Milwaukee. Everybody's gonna go to a, a Milwaukee Bucks game. Everybody's gonna go to the Art Museum, uh, Sea Lake, Michigan, things like that. But not everybody's gonna go to a small Vietnamese noodle shop on the south side uh, in a little neighborhood called Silver City that really the average traveler is never gonna go to. And so that's like, we always said, that's a level three, that's a level three visit, right? You're already warm with the, with the community, now you're gonna go to that little hole in the wall noodle shop. And so the people in the, in the TV show helped us get to level three faster. 
That's great. Courtney, what about you in Ottawa? You know, the idea of museums and culture is such an interesting component of, of what you're doing around community. How did you stress test that and how did you create a, a more encompassing approach to, to that? So it helped that we had just undertaken a stewardship plan. And so we, you know, we're all able to start singing from the same songbook. And um, what came of that is, you know, in and amongst our target audiences, the local resident for the first time really appeared. And that was, you know, something that was a little foreign to us, a little different. We weren't very used to speaking to the local resident. And it gave us a little bit of data, a little bit of research, and a little bit of backing so that when we would go to our stakeholders, that was probably the biggest stress test, was going to our stakeholders, who in this case were the official museums. Um, and you know, they're a big part of what we do, they're a big part of who we are, and we wanted to get them on board because they were still at the core and the crux of everything um, that we wanted to get out there. They were at the center of our campaign. And so, uh, it took a couple consultations, a few meetings. We went through the creative process with them, um, heard them out, listened to their concerns, went back, revised the campaign, did a little bit of tweaks, making sure that it still had the same creative integrity, but that the museums felt seen and heard and that they also felt represented. And that really showcased itself um, when we found a tagline for the campaign that they really felt uh, encompassed uh, who they are. And so our campaign tagline was inviting everybody to rediscover the city of museums, whether it was official or unofficial. And so at the end of the, uh, sorry, at the end of the day, we didn't necessarily get every single stakeholder on board, but when we launched the campaign, we had so many people who were so excited to see themselves represented, and the museums actually came back to us and wanted to know how they could partner with us and how they could become more involved. And I think that was the true <laughs> pinnacle of success that we were like, okay, we did it, we made it. Well, and Corinne, why don't you talk a little bit about the pre-screening that occurs at Pack Up and Go. This is a really interesting surprise travel um, company where they have a list of, of categories where your, your visitors can pick things that they're most interested in. So they stress test prior to picking destinations. So why don't you talk a little bit about those categories and the things that you see? Yeah, and please don't bell me. This is not a sales pitch. This is just how Pack Up and Go works. Uh, but the way that it works, when I say surprise travel, sometimes people think, oh, random travel. But it's absolutely not random. It is curated and planned for each individual traveler. Uh, so they come to our website. They decide their trip type. They do decide their departure dates. They let us know how many travelers and how many nights they want. And then, as Meredith said, they fill out the pre-trip survey, where they let us know all their information, their travel history, and their interests. Um, so this are the interests that we have on there. There's more than 30 different interests. So there are museums. Uh, there's amazing food and breweries. There's sports and different types of activities. And then once we have all that information, we have in-house travel planners who look at all of it, look at their budget and use it like a dating profile and try to make a love match between the traveler and a destination. Um, so this has really enabled us to send people to not just major tourist destinations across the US, but we're really trying to get people to smaller destinations. I mean, Milwaukee is one of our destinations. I'm sorry, I hadn't heard of Mammoth Lakes yet, but <laughs> let's talk about it. I think it'd be great for the outdoors. And we really want to get people um, changing their perspective on what a vacation is, how they can vacation, and where they vacation. Obviously, over-tourism is a huge hot-button issue, and we want people to be the first movers on the next big thing. And we know how big social media is, um, and sharing on social media to reflect smaller destinations across the US. So speaking of that, Dakota, talk to us a little bit about what was the most surprising part. When you focused on community for Mammoth Lakes, what happened? What was the most surprising thing? The thing that really you weren't expecting at all to occur? Yeah, so it really comes into right after the pandemic, right? We had all of this over tourism happening in our region and we really took a look at our overall brand, what we stood for, and we recognized that we can't have this idea of stewardship or sustainability just being a brand pillar that was just part of a deeper layer of what we stood for. We really wanted to make sure that it was one of the front facing things that encompassed our brand. And the way that we got there was really within our local community, within our stakeholders, who are upset with us as the tourism board in our community, right? Blaming us, you guys are the reason why all these people are here, right? You guys aren't listening to what we're saying. So we really took that step back, 
listened to what that community was saying, and we created a new brand campaign that we call The Real Unreal, right? Mammoth Lakes is so unreal and unbelievable in nature, we want to preserve it and protect it. We literally have a 15 second commercial spot that says like, it's so unreal here, please don't mess it up on your weekend getaway. And when we're doing screenings with this with our local community, one of our community members is like, are you allowed to say that in a marketing campaign? Are you like, are you allowed to legitimately tell somebody like, please don't mess this up on their weekend? And we were like, yes, because this is what we're standing for now. And so one of the most surprising things for us when we finally started actually really making sure that the community was on the same page as us and that we were listening to that community was slowly to start to change that narrative of us versus them. It is us, is the community, and if we're not all on the same page, well then that's when things start going haywire, right? So we have to make sure we're all on the same page, make sure we're truly representing, because we live there for a reason, right? And it's our backyard, it's their backyard, and finding that common interest between what drives the visitors to where we are and what's keeping the locals as to where we are, well that's the same language. And it was something really interesting when we finally, finally started checking those boxes. Courtney, what about you? Was there anything surprising that you found after you launched this community-focused effort? I think to echo what you're saying, it's exactly that. The people who live and work and play and stay in your destination are the, it's the same reasons that people are going to want to come and visit. And so it wasn't necessarily a surprising outcome, but it's definitely an outcome that we're now focused on more. So we want to learn more reasons and, and do that research internally. So we're always talking about data points externally, right? But we're never really looking internally to see what are the reasons that people live and play and stay in Ottawa. And so I think moving forward is just going to be engaging the local residents even more. And we've kind of started doing that a little bit and we are creating you know, guides. We have a My Ottawa guide that is all voted on by local residents and then that's what we're implementing and using in our campaigns and um, you know, furthering that, that narrative of who we are authentically because like, that is why people are, are coming to the destination. Josh, I mean, further to you, you, you have such an interesting utilization of locals. How, how are they responding? How are they feeling about not only featuring the, the small locals only restaurants, but being part of your campaign? How do the locals themselves in Milwaukee feel? Yeah, like there's that? been a, a really great uh, sort of, um, not a resurgence, but a surgence of pride. And that building of pride in the local community is so strong for a DMO of people becoming the advocates themselves beyond. And I know that's a, a fairly uh, a common practice for DMOs to say, hey, we need the locals to invite their friends and family to come here rather than going somewhere else, right? So inviting people. But the, the biggest thing, the biggest response has been residents saying, I want to be in that show. Like, how do I get in the show? <laughs> How do I get my business on the show? How do I tell the story? How do I help amplify the message in my own way, which has then carried that out to people sharing it on their social media and they're becoming their biggest advocates and cheerleaders for the community in a way that uh, I think they didn't realize they could be. Um, they didn't realize they could be the biggest champion. Um, you know, as a DMO, we are, we are the top influencer in our market. And I think we forget that sometimes. And so it's encouraging everyone else to be the influencers about our city rather than bringing in other influencers to our city to tell the story, we're now emp empowering our locals to be the influencers that share the story. So how are you extending that? that well, we've done, we've done that through, uh, you know, through celebrities as well. We've got a, a partnership with Bobby Portis Jr., who's on the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, a star athlete. So we've taken that to like a, a superstar level and having, having these bigger names share that story. Uh, and then we're doing it on a, on a smaller level where we're doing uh, uh, 50 different um, chefs have been, are gonna be featured. Uh, it's a whole thing we're going to be launching this summer. Our next campaign will be celebrating the chefs, so the, the, the faces and the people behind the recipes, behind the restaurants, whether that's James Beard Award winning or whether that's Mom and Pop Shop, uh, and having them actually not tell the story about their restaurant, but tell, them, tell the story about the restaurant or about the recipe that inspired them to open up a restaurant. And so we're going to be featuring the recipes you can't even eat at their restaurant. It's only the recipes that they would share with their friends and family, trying to get to that next level of, uh, a, vis of a visitor experience, saying, okay, I, I know that they love goulash, but I'm gonna eat, go eat their pan-seared salmon or whatever, but it's about inspiring, and so the locals are ready to inspire. So before we jump to some, some insight that Pack Up and Go has around communities that are affinity-based communities, Josh, are you starting to see visitors change their behaviors? and? distribution through other parts of the city? Yeah, definitely. Uh, everyone, the, the uh, 
shows uh, that featured a restaurant, they all reported like we never used to have wait times, you know, like things like that. So we're seeing the people are, we're ready to discover new things, and we're even getting great. We're actually getting, which is really wonderful, especially for a DMO, because we often get the negative uh, uh, letters or emails saying why did you do this or what are you doing there. What we've really seen are people throughout uh, the entire six-hour drive time that we've showed this uh, television show writing like love letters of why they love Milwaukee and how they had never knew these places existed and they're gonna plan a new trip to come back and see these new places that they've never been to because they have had only done those first level things and now they're like, we're ready to re reignite that passion we had for the city and so that's really the great thing. So the residents uh, as well are saying, I never knew that noodle shop existed. I never knew there was a Latin American museum on the south side of the city because I live on the north side and my path never takes me to that place. But now I know to go there. And so that's the, really the cool thing is people discovering stuff they had no idea was in their backyard. So that's a great intro into what Pack Up and Go also has the ability to do is you know identify affinity-based kinds of, of communities that really are interesting for DMOs to think about. It, it extends beyond the great list of restaurants, the great list of attractions, the things that we all know are important, but that we all have. So, Corinne, can you talk to us a little bit about what you've learned and what the DMOs can learn from you uh, from Pack Up and Go? Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned those interests, and with those interests, we have um, a content team that is constantly doing research to keep our um, list of recommendations updated. We have a, a backlog of 15,000 different recommendations. Um, so if someone checks off museums, then in their destination, we will give them recommendations for those. Um, and so we, as a company, uh, the end of our mission statement is to create community. It's really important to us that our travelers feel an affinity and a bond with the place that they go. And so when we're putting together these recommendations, we're focusing on small businesses. As a company, we do not send people to large chains. Obviously, there's going to be must-sees in every city, those, those tourist stops. But then otherwise, you know, we are looking for the VM noodle shops that are off the beaten path. Um, and so within those interests, obviously, we have a ton of data. Literally every single customer of Pack Up and Go has to fill out a survey. So we have a 100% response rate on that. Um, and the two top interests are restaurant for foodies and hole in the wall restaurants. And I think this is really interesting because to me, that's two ends of the, of the spectrum. And that's what I think the modern traveler is. They want to go to lunch at the hole in the wall restaurant with the dingy lighting and the bad marketing that's been there for 70 years. They want to go back to their hotel, they want to get changed, and they want to go to the restaurant for foodies. The trendy place, you know, that probably costs too much, but we all know how much, you know, food is important on vacation. And I think that the modern traveler wants the end-to-end -end experience. They want to see all of it because, and this I know has been a buzzword over the last couple of days, but they want an authentic experience. They want to to feel like they really know your destination. So in my advice to you, and so many of you are doing it, from Milwaukee to Atlanta to the, the tagline you just said, are showcasing these authentic experiences. And I think that's where we're starting to see things changed. I think travelers, we used to think travelers wanted something that was really, really polished. And now we're starting to understand that they want to see all of it. Dakota, I want to talk to you about what's next. Um, you talked about, I, after you dig out from this epic winter you've had, what, what's next for Mammoth Lakes and your community efforts? What are you doing next? Yeah, so it's a lot more than just education in a marketing sense, right? So we have our campaigns that are running currently that are out that have this marketing component to them, that have that whole educational, excuse me, that whole educational underlying. But the bigger part of that is now how can we take this education message and put it into a tangible, actionable response. And so what's next for us coming forward is not only utilizing these ideas of sending people to smaller restaurants and this and that, but actually getting out and proving that as a DMO, we're also helping take care of our environment and we're taking care of our community as a whole. In our board meeting just this last week, we came up with an entire list of improvements for around town. So utilizing some of our tourism budget to help improve tourism 
infrastructure in our region, noticing things. We're the front lines of complaints from tourists that come that say, there's not enough parking at a trailhead, there's not enough bathrooms, there's not enough facilities. So trying to figure out how to utilize the information that we're gathering to bring it to the town level to then bring the town up and forward from it. But more importantly, is really putting our actions into effect. And that's by not only organizing cleanups throughout our region, going out and making sure that we're supporting some of our other volunteer groups, such as Friends of the Inyo, or some of these other volunteer organizations that we have, but also creating our own. Doing large trash cleanups, we have what we call is facelift, act local. When I was working in Yosemite National Park, I was really intimately involved with the facelift cleanups that they do in our national parks took that to the home stage in Mammoth Lakes and really just blasted this in what we call facelift act local. Engaging our locals, engaging our tourists, and cleaning up trash, cleaning up things that were left behind, rebuilding trailheads, rebuilding things out in nature to make the visitor experience that much better. And then this last year we decided, you know what, it's not just enough to do it on the ground from what we can see, let's take it underwater. And we partnered with a program called Clean Up the Lake. My buddy Colin runs this organization, they cleaned up all 71 miles miles of shoreline from Lake Tahoe, 25 feet under the water. You think there's a lot of trash on the shore of a lake? Well, as soon as you get 25 feet underwater, they pulled out 62,000 pounds of trash out of 25 feet in shallower in Lake Tahoe. We brought them in last year. They started doing, we're called Mammoth Lakes, right? We have seven lakes in town limits, literally. There's lakes in town. Like you said, they're under like 40 plus feet of snow right now. But once things get melted out, we did the exploratory dives last year and really took a look at where's our drinking water coming from that people have been trashing and polluting for all these years. We need to make sure that we're cleaning up underneath that as well. Now you want to start getting your locals engaged and building this idea and this sense of community. Now we're not only talking about the educational component, now we're seeing tangible results from the people when they're out and about. Our locals are seeing our areas more cleaned up because of the efforts that we're doing. Our tourists are having a better visitor experience. And we're really seeing that elevated as we continue continue smaller projects and these larger projects. That's great. Uh, Courtney, what about you? What are you, what are you guys doing next? What, what do you see as next for Ottawa? I think it's taking what we're learning and, and taking, you know, what we're learning from this campaign that we're running right now, the unofficial museums, and, and adapting and growing from there and making sure that, again, our stakeholders are heard, but also that we're engaging so much more than just the, the, the tourism stakeholders, the, the average Joe. Uh, it needs to have a voice in, in exactly what we're doing and it's our job now to move a little bit more from beyond just you know destination marketing and destination management to stewardship and to you know quality of life and we have a say in, in that and we're doing a bit of our own facelift and you know we're going out into the community and, and it's not to say that you know we can change all levels of government <laughs> and implement all of these things but we want to seat at the table and we want a voice and we want to be able to partake in that conversation and so our organization is really dedicated um, to kind of shifting our focus. Marketing and management of the destination is still paramount and super important but what else can we do above and beyond that and that's kind of where we're at right now and, and what we're bringing into 2023. What about you Josh? Uh, one of our biggest initiatives is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, Milwaukee is a uh, minority-majority city, which many people don't uh, realize. Uh, have been, be, being in the state of Wisconsin, most people assume it is uh, 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 a very much a white destination. Uh, but as a minority-majority uh, city, what we're finding was the visitors who were coming into our community were, were 90, over 90% white based on all of our data that we we're getting with uh, tourism economics and uh, near data and some other uh, of the other great companies like Arrivalist that we work with. So we know what we had to do was, what we really wanted to do was say, we want the travelers who are coming to our community to better reflect the community that they're coming to. And so we really wanted to put an emphasis on, on DEI efforts that would bring diverse travelers to our community so that the people who were uh, the residents who are representing our community would also feel welcome with the guests who are coming. So it's almost a, a maybe sometimes in a way a reverse of uh, how uh, other dest destinations might be. Uh, but diversity, equity, inclusion is a huge component of it. So as we tell the stories, as we do this television show, as we work with local influencers, making sure that we were, have a diverse representation of the people throughout our community uh, was high value to us because we wanted to share every single story from every single demographic that we have. And how do you how do you balance that? How do you balance that with the promotion overall? 
the, these sort of micro communities. How are you balancing that, Josh? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really hard because you know uh, in marketing, uh, it's it's one of those uh, age old debates that all of you probably have had, uh, where you sat around a table and you said. Uh, do we, does this photo need a Hispanic person in it? Does this photo need a, and you don't, and those conversations are always horrible to have because you, you know that you're not being authentic, which is what we've heard for the last two days here. And so really what we've been really doing is just engaging in the community, going to the community and meeting, meeting the community where they are to help them tell the story to us rather than us dictating the story through our marketing. And so what we found is as soon as we started just asking the questions and then being open to the answers at their table, not our table, uh, we found it to be much easier to have get everything that we want to accomplish. And so most recently, uh, we found a, a Hispanic language uh, marketing agency in our community that we didn't know existed. We brought them in. We did a half-day workshop with them with our staff just to get them educated on what it's like to market to Hispanic travelers and, and, uh, and then what it's like, what, what the Hispanic market in our city is like compared to other cities. And so finding that uh, avenue was crucial to us to accomplish our goals. That's great. So we only have a few minutes left, but I want to find out what advice each of you would give to the other destination marketing organizations here in the room and about what worked, what didn't work, and some pitfalls to avoid. So let's start with you, Corinne. What are, what's some advice you would give to the, to the DMOs here? Yeah, absolutely. So something that has really helped um, my marketing team, especially over the last uh, couple of years, is embodying this mantra of test and learn. And Doing so in the workplace has also helped me in my personal life. But trends, technologies, global pandemics, things are going to come up. And we don't have control over what changes. Uh, TikTok, is it going to be banned tomorrow? I hope not, but maybe. And I think if you, as a leader at your company, can create an environment of flexibility, of not being a stick in the mud, but looking forward to the next thing. And this doesn't mean picking up every single shiny object. It does, you know, you still have to be selective as a leader. But test and learn means not being afraid of failure. It means everything is just a science experiment. We're just testing, and if it doesn't go the way we want, we can tinker with it, we can stop doing it, and if it does go the way we want, fantastic, keep doing it. So test and learn as a mantra has been a game changer for us. Um, and then also setting goals. And I know that this has also been said at this conference, but setting goals is so important to build a roadmap and to avoid you know, every single shiny object. Because when you do adopt a test and learn mentality, which again, I recommend, you're gonna start getting a lot more creative ideas. And that's what you want. You wanna foster innovation on your teams. But at the same time, you need to set really specific goals so your team knows, okay, what is important for me right now? And what can I come back to? What can I put? in what we call the parking lot. And it's not a no, but it's, it's a not right now. And I think that these two things, the test and learn, and then having a clear roadmap for your team are really important to setting up success. Josh, what about you? What, what advice would you give this group? Yeah, the, one of the first, my first bit of advice would be, uh, it's a pretty common one, but it's swing for the fences. Go big um, and not, don't be afraid to go big. And whatever that means to you and whatever uh, world that is, if you have a crazy idea, do it. Uh, because I think what you'll find is that your community will embrace that thing. Uh, and probably what you'll find out, like what we did most recently with doing some billboard advertising in Times Square uh, over New Year's Eve, um, we, we did it and we had some people on our staff who were a little skeptical and they're like, well, I don't know how the community's gonna see this. It's a lot of money and uh, I don't, why are we advertising in New York City? It's, things like that. It happened and the outpour of people saying, why didn't you do this sooner? Like we should have been shouting about Milwaukee in, in Times Square sooner. And so what we found out was that people were wanting us to go big and we weren't. And so now we have that sort of blessing from them to say, yeah, let's do some crazy things. And so we've already got our list of, of crazy big things to do uh, in the future. And then the, the other quick thing would be, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of cathedral thinking. Everything that a DMO does, every ad we place, every community engagement thing that we do, every bit of stewardship is built for the next generation. And so everything we have to do has to be for that next generation in mind to sustain the vibrancy of the communities that we serve. Great. Dakota, what about you? Uh, there's uh, so many different directions to go with this, but you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice that I think came from where we were at is one, don't be afraid to listen to your community and really make sure that you are having the difficult conversations, like you were saying, meet them at their table, right? And really listen to what your community wants, 
But also, you know, we put out three things this year that we're really just pushing out across our channels. And this is this idea of be patient, be considerate, and be kind. And right now we're asking all visitors to our region, reminding all of our tourists, all of our locals, if you can remember those three things while you're a tourist and while you're traveling, this is really the largest takeaway that we have as far as getting that messaging out there of reminding your people that are coming to visit, you're still gonna have the vacation of your lifetime, you're still gonna be out having fun, but while you're a traveler, don't forget to be patient, be considerate, and be kind. Those three things go a long way in 2023. Great, that's wonderful advice. What about you, Courtney? What, what, what advice would you give this group? Yeah, first word and the last word, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wise words. Um, I think, to reiterate, we have to look at ourselves just beyond the destination marketing and management organizations. We need to start looking at stewardship and what that means and, and how we play a role in that quality of life and in the community. And whether you know it's over tourism or under tourism, it's still, it, you, you still have an impact and it's still really important and we need to figure out what role that is and how does that look like and, and, and where can we essentially do better. And I think it's also extremely important, like I said, we just went through a stewardship plan. so. It's super helpful. We're all singing from the same songbook. All levels of our organization, all departments, and having that data and that research to back up, you know, why we're, you know, uh, coming up with different campaigns or why we're pushing for certain things um, really helps when it's coming from all levels, and that really gets that buy-in from the stakeholders that can kind of be tricky sometimes, or, uh, you know, you're, I don't think you're ever, ever going to get all stakeholders on board, but um, at least being able to kind of come in with a concise and consistent message and the reasons why, I think you're, you're going to have a much better time um, in getting them to buy in. Great. Well, we have a few minutes for questions. Are there any questions the audience would like to ask any of the panelists about how they've created community and, and had an impact for their local community? Yes. Um, I'm wondering what role you play in supporting and fostering sustainable and green initiatives within your organization. Great question. So the question was, for those of you who couldn't hear, what role do the panelists play in supporting, in introducing, supporting, and growing green initiatives within the organizations? Josh, do you want to start? Yeah, ours, for us, it's uh, we, have, uh, we don't do a, a ton of it, to be honest with you, uh, but what we've look to do is uh, start community cleanup efforts. And we, have, we are known as the freshwater capital of the world, uh, believe it or not, in Milwaukee. And so we work a lot with local, our local uh, water treatment facilities and our local stakeholders in that regard. Uh, so that's the biggest environmental impact we've had is freshwater cleanup. Dakota, what about you? Yeah, I, this is a great question, and I appreciate you bringing it up. You know, so Mammoth Lakes Tourism, we're a certified green business, and we are also pushing, yeah, super cool. We're also pushing the incentive for our community. We fully support our green business program. But not only that, within my position, I also wear the hats as our special event manager as well. And so I am directly in charge of 56 different of our special events that we bring into our community. And before we'll give them any community funding, we put them through an entire green events checklist program and make sure that, you know, we, we're pushing the efforts to, buy, to ban single-use plastics within our community and also to help support incentives within our restaurants to get rid of styrofoam and, you know, put in more water bottle refill stations, really trying to take a look at the sustainability side, not just the stewardship side. That's great. That's great. Any other questions from the floor for this, these panelists? Seeing none, thank you guys so much. Really excellent. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.